In this session, we're going to talk about the budget 2019 that's going to come uh, in the next few days and the expectations from this particular uh, particular budget. Uh, remember that the 2019 budget is an interim budget. So uh, interim budget because we are headed into elections. So there could be uh, uh, generally in interim budgets, you don't have too many uh, path breaking or significant changes to the schemes that are there. There's no rule, but that's the broad norm. What's the broad agenda for today? We're going to discuss a few things. We're going to look at what were the last year budget estimates. What are the key themes in this budget? We we'll look at something called as internal and extra budgetary resources and understand the significance of that. Farm outlay or farmer support package that is expected in this budget is what we're going to look at. And what are the expectations on the income taxation front is, got to, is something that we are going to look at. Right. So let's start with last year uh, budget estimates what the government of India had given in terms of the FY19 budget. Uh, FY18 final numbers versus FY19 budget, the numbers are available and that's what we see. Now, right at the bottom of the screen, you see the nominal GDP number and there was an expectation of 11.5% growth in the nominal GDP, which resulted in the GDP number coming at, uh, at uh, you know, 1.85 crore crore. Uh, these numbers are in INR crore. So, We'll use that uh, as we go along. Now, if you look at the broad estimates, the gross tax revenue was expected to be about 22 lakh crore. And that as a percentage of your GDP in terms of the government's expectation was 12.5% approximately. So that's a slightly, uh, you know, the government was expecting a substantial jump in the gross tax revenue, about a 17% increment over this, uh, this year was what was assumed when the last budget was given. The government had then gone down and said uh, some of the other parameters like non-tax revenue, which is essentially what the government gets in the form of dividends, in the form of buybacks, uh, in the form of, uh, you know, RBI dividend, all of that uh, comes here. Right. So that was expected to grow by 4%. Uh, then you have other receipts like disinvestment and all which were coming here. And that would give us a sense of what are the total receipts of the government of India. Right. Uh, before we look at the total receipts, let's outline what they said would be total expenditure. So total expenditure was about 24 lakh crore. And out of this 24 lakh crore, nearly 87% was something called as revenue expenditure. Now, revenue expenditure basically includes all your uh, pensions, all your, uh, uh, you know, the defense spending, the spending around uh, interest payments, major subsidies, all of that comes here. So 21 lakh crore was that. And capital expenditure, which is anything that adds an asset for the government, is uh, was expected to be about 3 lakh crore. Right. So that's the broad spectrum of what uh, what the budget was. The difference between the receipt and the expenditure was uh, was basically the fiscal deficit, which is also the amount that was supposed to be borrowed. Right. So that was the borrowing expectation of the government that six lakh crore has to be borrowed. Six lakh crore works to about three point four percent of uh, our uh, our total GDP. Right. So that's the broad contour of what was defined last year. Right. Now let's move ahead and try and look at this year and, you know, what's going to happen and what we are looking at. Typically, any budget in an emerging market, which is uh, kind of grappling for uh, resources and infrastructure growth is going to be between, you know, a sort of a, a decision point between whether you will see populism or you will see fiscal prudence. Fiscal prudence would basically mean that uh, the spending is uh, efficient and you're looking at basically allocating money towards resources or towards schemes that are going to generate revenue in the future. Right. Populism, on the other hand, looks at a more short term mechanism in terms of, you know, what the government is basically going to do with the money and uh, what are the outcomes that can be achieved out of it. So subsidy, for example, is populism. It may not be fiscal prudence in its purest sense. Capital expenditure would probably be fiscal prudence, but it will not be populism in the near term. Right now, interim budget is what is the term used for this budget because we are heading into the election. So the actual budget for this year would come after the elections, after the new government is formed. This budget is just an outline in terms of, you know, what is going to be the uh, broad expectation of the government in terms of, uh, you know, how uh, they are looking at the next year panning out. 
the usual norm is not to announce any major initiatives in the interim budget but there is no rule around it right no one stops the government from going and announcing something significant which uh, they believe could be pulled off in the next uh, next few uh, you know quarters and if they do believe that you know there is a fair likelihood that they could come back into power then obviously they have the resources to manage that so there is no rule that major announcements cannot be done uh, and so you could expect some interesting announcements in this budget as you go along now what are the major things that you're going to look at obviously you are looking at an eye on the elections so there are three or four major parameters that you're going to look at uh farm sector so given what's happened in the recent past in terms of the elections in various states and the fact there is generally an agrarian distress at this point of time that keeps getting talked about rural sector is not doing too well it is likely that the government is going to come with some sort of a farmer support scheme there were already farm loan waivers announced in a lot of the states uh, there could also be something called as a direct benefit transfer to farmers a certain set of states have already implemented it and there's already talk that you know it could be a scheme that could be implemented on a central level more on this in a few minutes there could also be an increase in rural scheme outlays purely because uh, you know you could uh, you could see an extra, you know extension in terms of mn rega and those kind of allocations already from the existing allocation of mn rega the government has increased the allocation in uh, in between during the year that was our expectation because they had announced a smaller number and it was unlikely that that smaller number could be uh, could be met purely because uh, you would want to kind of increase spending on employment generating opportunities right the second theme that you're probably going to see or continue seeing is affordable housing purely because the government has said that by 2022 you are looking at housing for all so that's an area that uh, probably will keep seeing an interest urban uh, you know urban uh, housing construction housing uh, finance companies housing equipment there is going to be a sort of a focus on this segment good or bad we don't know at this point but there is going to be definitely a focus on this segment and this uh, this set uh in taxes you could expect on the indirect tax front a uh, stabilization on the gst collections uh, they have been kind of stable but they're lower than what the expectation was so you would expect that to come and there is a section that is expecting an income tax relief uh, for a major chunk of uh, the population purely because uh, tax paying population purely because uh, in recent past they have announced uh, the increase of reservation quota to uh, to you know the the economically backward uh, segments of the society um, and there they have put a criteria as 8 lakh uh, of of household income so you could uh, probably see some sort of a debate around that and you know possibly getting into the elections there is a there's a chance that that could uh, that could get exercised here as well something on that front could get exercised here as well on the infrastructure segment capital expenditure might take a back seat for the while because uh, if the government has to really boost spending in this particular budget they would probably focus more on the agriculture rural sector housing sector rather than going and creating big bang infra at this point of time they may not even have the resources to deal with that so that's what we see now let's look at the budget versus actual fy19 so we already saw what was the budget number we are now looking at what is the year to date number at this point of time so obviously remember that year to date numbers are not a great reflection because a lot of the things uh, are back ended and some of the things are front ended so most of your expenditure is sort of front ended but your tax revenue is sort of back ended which means most of it comes towards the final part of the year right so at this point of time clearly this is uh, this is still november right so the first 8 months of the year we are at half of our taxation target and that's largely because on the on the broad contour of our achievement in terms of gst uh, targets we have not really been uh, doing as well corporate tax collection has also been slower than what was expected the only bright spot in that is direct uh, income tax collection which has been exceeding expectations so this expectation last year of a 17% growth is unlikely to materialize and so we are probably going to see somewhere around a 10% kind of a growth towards the end of the year that ends up with about 21.4 lakh crore rather than a 22.7 lakh crore kind of a number right if that 
kind of gives you a sense if you think about it roughly about uh, uh, if you look at this number roughly about 18,000 crore right is going to be about 0.1 percent of GDP so if you look at the shortfall that's about 1 lakh 30 35,000 crore so we are already talking about 60 basis points of GDP shortfall on the account of tax now that would mean that if your fiscal deficit target was 3.4 it should already go to 4 percent right but what is also likely to happen is you're probably not seeing an equivalent uh, spending pattern as well uh, let's look at the revenue parts first on the non-tax revenue front you are expected to kind of meet the target also probably exceed it in the case of certain scenarios purely because the government has continuously been saying that RBI's reserves need to be transferred and there could be a one-time exercise around that especially around this election year the entire tussle between the government and RBI could probably uh, tell us that uh, this number is definitely going to get met and most likely it is probably going to exceed the actual expectation in terms of disinvestment so far there has been dismal progress and this also is broadly courtesy uh, a couple of uh, ETFs that have come out so it's unlikely that the government might meet the target uh, given what uh, broad secondary market conditions are so we have kind of assumed that you know there'll be a shortfall on the disinvestment front we will not be able to meet that now note that there is a shortfall on disinvestment of about 18,000 odd crore or 20,000 crore and there is a shortfall on income of about 1 lakh 30,000 crore you add this together that already goes to 60 to 70 basis points of GDP fiscal deficit should increase but it is also likely that your expenditure will go down so it's possible that capital expenditure does not go up to the level expected it stays what the number was last year purely because uh, the government may not have resources even revenue expenditure you would note that interest payment has to be done but there is a possibility of a little bit of reduction there by reduction in subsidies now this is a little bit odd because you wouldn't expect this to happen in an election year and that's where some interesting accounting jugglery comes in so we expect the government to come and report a headline fiscal deficit number of 3.5 percent there or thereabouts it may not be materially different from what the government had initially projected but let's try and gauge uh, at this point of time in terms of you know how do we uh, arrive at this number it is unlikely that the government is going to meet its revenue or receipt targets on any front and so consequently there will be a hit on the expenditure but you can't really take a hit on the expenditure because this is an election year so you don't want to take a hit on the expenditure you probably want to do more expenditure and so it's important to understand where is that money going to come from right let's quickly look at the GST collection so far so if you look at the broad GST collections the target was more than 12 lakh crore but we have moved beyond 1 lakh crore only in a couple of months there's almost always a shortfall of about 5,000 crore so that itself towards the end adds up to something like uh, you know 60,000 odd crore of shortfall on account of uh, GST itself right uh, and the actual actual thought was around more than 12 lakh crore slightly more so this itself is going to give a hit of 30 to 40 basis points on the on the overall uh, tax collection uh, as a percentage of GDP uh, also corporate tax collection has been lower courtesy lower and slower growth at this point of time so the expectations around that have not been met the government also had an expectation of long-term capital gain tax at about 20,000 crore when the budget was announced approximately I think even that is not going to get met uh, in this premise so it's unlikely that we are going to see any kind of uh, significant jump from now on in terms of GST collections because everything anyway we're kind of close to the year the numbers are available till December and we are in the end of January so it's unlikely that we're going to see a substantial revival from now on till the election in any case right that's where interestingly this term called IEBR or internal and extra budgetary resources steps in right now what you see on the screen are excerpts from uh, reports of the CAG right the Auditor Comptroller and Auditor General for uh, Government of India and they have basically done some sort of analysis of uh, data points around how does this play out right now remember as a simple scheme if the government is going to reduce expenditure here they could easily ask agencies like NHAI 
or agency like Food Corporation of India to borrow money and then spend. Now, this is while guaranteed by the government, not included on this table. Right. So this is extra budgetary resources that are coming out and all governments in the world do it. Typically, they don't uh, they don't uh, just borrow money on their own account. They also borrow money that is supposedly guaranteed by them, but it doesn't appear on the budget sheet. So the budget looks better than what it is. But at the same time, that actual spending is still happening. So if you look at the Food Corporation of India, then you will see that there are distribution that the com that the government has done is not clear uh, to to kind of clear all the food subsidies bill raised by food corporation of india so now the way the food corporation of india works uh, is uh, they are just an agency for the government to kind of distribute the subsidy there is a subsidy expenditure that they end up taking and the government basically repays some part of it. They should ideally repay the entire part, but some part of it could be paid. So there is a carryover liability. So for example, in 2011-12, about 60,000 crore was the expenditure, but uh, only about 36,000 crore got paid. So 23,000 crore was carryover. If you note, this carryover uh, liability has been increasing, which basically means the government is paying less and less when the subsidy bill is actually increasing more and more every year. So practically, if you look at the last year, there was no payment. It just kind of went through, right? Now, where does the Food Corporation of India get this from? So they could raise it from unsecured short-term loans. And interestingly, the National Small Savings Fund gives out 70,000 crore to Food Corporation of India. In fact, last year, it kind of extended 70,000 crore to Food Corporation of India. And... Uh, this is basically loan taken by the Food Corporation of India, backed by Government of India, but not appearing on the balance sheet of Government of India directly, right? But it has to be honored by Government of India if, you know, you are pushed into a corner. So technically, this 70,000 crore should be borrowed by the government in a very clean environment and given to Food Corporation of India. But the Government of India is not borrowing it. FCI is going to borrowing it in the market, right? Or is being given money by NSSF. So all the national small savings are going to go there. Interestingly, if you look at the data point of the annual report, so 2018 annual report is not yet out for FCI. 2017 annual report, if you go and dig it into the FCI website, you will see that long-term borrowings from the government are at 13,000 crore, so there is no change. But there is a substantial change in other long-term liabilities. Right? This has increased by about close to 56,000 crore. Correct? And then even short term borrowings have kind of gone up and uh, that number has also kind of increased. So these numbers basically add up. Now, where is this 56,000 crore coming from? If you look at this non-current uh, sort of other long term liabilities here, National Small Saving Fund is giving this 56,000 crore. You also read that Government of India released a loan of 70,000 crore from the NSSF during this financial year. And at the same time, they are simultaneously withdrawing a subsidy of the equivalent amount and converting it into an NSSF loan. So what has happened is NSSF has given money to the Food Corporation of India and GOI, which was supposed to give this money, has crossed this out. So there is a reduction in the government expenditure by 70,000 crore. But technically, it has not reduced because the government is still supposed to pay NSSF at some point of time in case there is a shortfall or the government is expecting that Food Corporation of India is going to pay to NSSF. But Food Corporation of India does not earn anything, right? So what is being said, interestingly, is the NSSF loan would be adjusted in a phased manner in the next five financial years, starting from the financial year 2017-18. And for the recovery, the government will make an additional subsidy allocation of 14,000 crore every year during this period. So now the government is saying that for this particular loans repayment, every year the government is going to increase the subsidy amount by 14,000 crore. But that's only for this year and that's assuming that it is only going to happen in this particular year. Right? This was 2016-17. Apparently the same thing has happened in 2017-18 as well. So 70,000 crore which was to be spread over these five years is anyway on the books. Another 50 to 70,000 crore has come on the books that will be spread over another five years. So this is 
effectively you know like um, for lack of better word it's it's like a ponzi scheme where you are borrowing to continue repaying the existing borrowings but all governments across the world work like that purely because there is a backing of the government so there's nothing wrong in this us also does the same uh, but it is just that it under reports your fiscal deficit number by a substantial amount so you need to be aware of this the same is true with nhai so nhai is going and borrowing about uh, 25000 crore of unsecured loan now that's a huge amount of a loan that is being taken and that itself 25000 crore is about uh, you know approximately equal to 13 to 13 to 14 basis points of your gdp now this should have come from the government but nhai is borrowing it this is what the cag had said in their report this is the audit report essentially so they say such off budget financial arrangement defers committed liability being interest bearing increases cost of subsidy and understates the annual subsidy expenditure and prevents transparent depiction of fiscal indicators for a relevant year and that's the problem that uh, we are anticipating uh, is happening at this point of time as i said the same is also true for the us government so there is no um, uh, no point singling out indian government for doing something like this every government basically does this but it is important to note that this is happening right with that in mind we can then move ahead and make certain assumptions for the next year right assuming that our expectations for this set of numbers is correct and of course that extra budgetary allocations are going to happen we are then making some assumptions for 2020 and then we'll talk about the rationale for those assumptions tax revenue is probably going to increase by 12% and that's probably because uh, you would see earnings improve a bit in this particular year you are also going to see continuous support on uh, you know the income tax scenario purely because of better compliance uh, uh, more number of people joining the workforce etc and you're probably going to see gst stabilization so you're likely to see that gst numbers might see an increase of 5 to 10% over the uh, over a year on year basis so if you're going to end this year at about 11.3 11.4 lakh crore you're probably going to get 12 and a half to 13 lakh crore next year and so that is a benefit that's probably uh, that's probably available that's uh, going to increase this scenario we have not assumed any major increase in non tax revenue right now in terms of the expenditure we are assuming a 10% increase in the overall expenditure from where it was although uh, the government may or may not come and announce that uh, interest payments are likely to be 10% higher purely because you uh, you have seen uh, that uh, the loans have gone up subsidy number is you know you need to take it with a pinch of salt because this number last year was supposed to be 2.6 lakh crore it's expected to come lower because the government is moving the subsidy off its balance sheet and taking it on the balance sheet of some other corporation right uh, so you're expecting a slight increase now some of the reasons why you're not expecting a very big increase here is because fuel prices are kind of under control right so that's kind of taken care of in terms of the data uh your interest payments may not increase too much because interest rates have again kind of come down and with inflation uh, in uh, in control you're expected to see interest rates going down further which might then result in a slightly better uh, uh, scenario on the interest payment itself so we might actually be overestimating some of this right capital expenditure if it is outlined at a 10% increment is actually still lower than what was outlined in the last year budget but uh, that's the best i think the government can do at this point of time don't expect them to do big bank disinvestment at this point of time given the market conditions they shouldn't really look at market conditions but that's what uh, is likely to happen you might see an uptick in non tax revenue if rbi decides to kind of give a one time uh, dividend once again exceeding what the normal uh, usual average is that is a possibility the government is likely to suggest a fiscal deficit number of 3.5% but most likely everyone on the street in the market knows that this is not a correct depiction of the entire scenario you are likely to probably see an extension of uh, of uh, the the number by uh, about 50 70 basis points if you look at all the uh, extra budgetary resources that have been taken uh, into consideration right so all that would come on the picture as well if um, if we were to add that a clearer reflection would be about 4 4.2% of gdp is what our fiscal deficit would be right 
Disinvestment could be slightly higher uh, in the event of any shortfall, but let's see what the market conditions are, whether the government likes to do that. Revenue expenditure may not increase too much for a variety of reasons. Revenue expenditure, as I said, interest payments and subsidies are not likely to increase too much, even on account of things like salary, etc., you're unlikely to see too much increase because seventh pay commission is already kind of done. So you are likely to see a slight or mild increase on these numbers and courtesy which the government will come up and come up with a number on fiscal deficit. Now remember, in an election year, usually history suggests in interim budgets that the government ends up overestimating this part in the budget and they end up underestimating this part. So the expenditure that they claim is going to happen will be, you know, not met and higher expenditure will occur. Income that they claim is going to happen will be not met. So what ends up happening usually is fiscal deficit is going to increase. They are also going to end up underestimating the fiscal deficit. It doesn't affect us too much purely because while three and a half percent is a number, the government of India does not necessarily have a constraint in terms of borrowing money. There is enough and more borrowing capacity available with government of India and overall levels this 30, 40, 50,000 crore doesn't really matter because at the end it is like 10 billion dollars. You know, 70,000 crore is 10 billion dollars and total debt of government of India at this point of time that is outstanding. Central government would be about 1 trillion dollars. So that's a thousand billion. So you're talking, you know, 70,000 crore of extra debt is about 1% of liability uh, for government of India, which on an overall scale may not be that material. It's just that I think if you're not aware, then we might completely miss that picture and assume that the fiscal deficit target is being met year on year. Right now, what do you expect in this uh, this budget? We still don't know how this will come in, but there is a talking and possibility of a direct package for farmers. And when we say direct package, they're probably going to kind of give a direct cash support. Will they remove some sort of a fertilizer subsidy in lieu of that? We don't know as yet. But assuming that uh, they're going to continue with the election year scenario, it is very unlikely that they're going to remove anything till the time the elections get over. So there is going to be an extension of direct cash support. Now, are there any precedents? So Telangana had announced this in the state and the ruling party had a thumping victory in the elections recently. They had announced it before the elections, TRS. They had announced 4,000 per acre per crop. When I say per acre per crop is because some uh, field there are multiple uh, crop cycles, right? So you could uh, kind of have two or three cycles of crops in the same uh, land in the year. So 4,000 rupees is per acre per crop given to each farmer as direct cash. This scheme supported all farmers. There was no, uh, no discrimination in terms of size of land holding or income of farmers. Similar schemes were launched in Odisha and Jharkhand recently. However, for a small and marginal farmer base, if such a scheme is launched pan India, then what is the what is the likely impact? Right. So in Odisha, for example, they had said all small and marginal farmers that covered basically 92 percent of the volume of farmers. Right. But probably the land is not as uh, as big. Most of the larger farmers hold a lot of larger land. So here they kind of announced something like 5000 rupees per acre per crop to all these marginal farmers. Small and marginal farmers definition as per most reports is suggested as less than five acre of land that that farmers have, right? So if such a scheme is basically announced uh, pan India. So uh, there are reports which basically suggest that the relief is assumed at rupees 5,000 per acre per crop. And for farmers with less than, you know, five acres of land, this covers 86% of all farmers. The total cost is about 1.2 lakh crore, right? That's what is, uh, is expected. So 1.2 lakh crore is the expectation. And the center has said that, uh, you know, they could share 60, 40 with the participating, participating states. So we're talking about about 70,000 crore of uh, of extra spending now this would basically work at about 30 to 35 basis points of the gdp for the center so that's an increment to the fiscal deficit that's going to happen now whether they're going to take it extra budgetary uh, off the budget table or they're going to bring it on the budget table and say that i'm going to reduce something else by the same amount uh, that is quite likely 
honestly 70000 crore is not a very large deal for government of india because if you think about the government stake in some of the uh, companies that are supposed to be divested uh, that itself will add up to somewhere between 2 to 3 lakh crore right that's a fairly straightforward kind of calculation if the government has to do it even one time and even if they end up borrowing the 70000 crore that's about 30 basis points of uh, gdp and uh, approximately about 10 billion dollars which is about uh, close to 1% of their total outstanding loan at this point of time so unlikely that the government would be too bothered about it at this stage they might actually off uh, you know remove some of the subsidy on the account of fertilizers and then pass that through an off budget uh, scenario in this place but um, this is likely to come purely because uh, as you enter into the elections with a uh, with a backdrop in terms of data that suggests that rural stress is causing them to lose elections in the in the central part of india where the election results were adverse for the ruling government it is likely that the scheme is going to come in and it's going to cover 86% of the farmers it obviously would uh, would result in capital expenditure surf, uh, suffering for another year but you know you would expect that in an election budget um, i doubt that uh, they're going to think too much about capital expenditure in this interim budget once the elections are over in the final budget you could tweak around things a little bit but uh, at this point of time it's a likely expectation that this is going to come in that's one part of the scenario the second could be a you know income tax cut that could be in the offering uh and we have said that uh you know broadly uh the the government's understanding of economically backward uh, section is 8 lakhs of household income so we don't have the uh, date so this is for fy 17 16 17 assessment year 2017 18 data from the income tax uh, department website uh in terms of distribution of the filers individual return filers uh, number of returns in terms of their income right so in 2016 17 4.6 crore uh, filers had filed uh, their income tax returns this number has gone up now to about 5.4 crore in the current year individual uh, tax filers remember there are also corporates there are hufs and all those things that are there which adds up to more than 6 uh, and 1/2 crore but at this point of time 5.4 crore is the individual tax filers in india and uh, that's an increase from here to here that's about you know approximately a 15 17% increase in the base right so in the absence of data we don't have anything to work with we are looking at uh, people let's say argument sake below 10 lakhs of income so that's what we are looking at right now if you take this data out everything above this line if you take this data out and try and work around you have average gross total income of people available remember in india the taxation slabs work like uh, up to 2.5 lakhs there is zero tax then 2.5 to 5 there is 5% and i'm using a working male for this analysis because that's the highest amount of uh, tax available uh, you could reduce it in senior citizens and women uh, 5 to 10 is 20% slab and greater than 10 is 30% slab so i'm going to take this into account right and remember there are tax breaks that are available on account of section 80c like investment in mutual funds and all that so we're going to keep that in mind as well so practically for someone who has a 5 lakh income you can have a total income of 6.5 lakh and then still be taxed only on 5 lakhs because that 1.5 lakh is available under atc deduction right ppf uh, employee provident fund uh, and uh, lic premium or insurance premium and uh, mutual funds equity linked savings schemes right so this segment if we were to actually calculate assuming that this entire segment this so i have an income i can multiply it with the number of returns and get the total amount if this entire segment of income pays zero tax the hit on the government of india would work out to somewhere to the tune of 27000 crore that's basically saying that no one till the income of 10 lakhs pays any tax the hit is 27000 crore on that account even assuming that this is for fy 17 in fy 18 this number might increase by 15% and in fy 19 it might increase by another 15 20% so you are talking something around 
35 to 40 thousand crore hit if the government of india says that there is no tax up to 10 lakhs now we already said 35 to 40 thousand crore in terms of their uh, their estimate uh, is peanuts uh, if you look at them giving out 70 thousand crore here just to give you an idea uh, excise duty on petrol if you take a look at the excise duty on petrol so we are saying 35,000 crore to 40,000 crore is revenue loss for the government if no income tax up to 10 lakhs, right? Now, an extra 1 rupee on petrol and diesel right petrol and diesel in terms of excise duty gives the government about 6500 crore right so practically if they for example increase excise duty on petrol and diesel by 5 rupees this goes up and they say no tax up to 10 lakhs a lot of the people in the in the country would actually be happy with this entire environment and that would still be broadly revenue neutral for the government of india what that would also encourage is a lot of people who are not filing returns at this point of time will start filing because there is no tax up to 10 lakhs of income any which ways. That's assuming that they go to 10 lakhs in any case. Even if they don't go up to 10 lakhs and they kind of move the slabs around, in no case the actual impact is going to be beyond 50,000 crore if they start moving at the lower end of the spectrum. So again, one of the things that you know, honestly, we had expected it last year as well, and we were surprised it didn't come through given the kind of backdrop around demonetization and GST. But now heading into the election, there is a fair likelihood that this might come. And honestly, this is not a complete revenue loss because this is extra disposable income in the hands of people. So it should help in increasing some sort of indirect tax, right? So the entire 35, 40,000 will not go for a for a waste because you will consume something and some sort of GST would come in on that consumption. So that's an important understanding that the government could do. In fact, if you look at disinvestments, they have stake in these uh, special undertaking of uh, UTI companies. There are four companies under this. The government has stake in LNT, the government has stake in Axis Bank, ITC and Hindustan Zinc. The combined stake of these companies is about 1 lakh crore. The value of that for the government this 1 lakh crore can basically if the government decides to sell all these four the 1 lakh crore can basically support at least for this year both the farm uh, benefit package and uh, the income tax package and then you know obviously you can kind of roll around after the elections so there is a likelihood that you could see something on this front as well so that's broadly what is there to so just summarize you're likely to see a fiscal deficit number at about 3.5 percent but it is going to be supported by extra budgetary resources so you have to be careful and look at that in detail budget likely to underestimate expenses overestimate income and underestimate fiscal deficit uh, farmer support package is likely and likely relaxation in income tax slabs we could be in for a positive surprise here but uh, we just looked at you know an extreme scenario in which case if there is a 10000 crore you know if you if you kind of take up the slabs all the way up to 10 lakhs what is the likely hit to the government of india uh, but you could expect that probably something like a 5 to 6 lakhs up to that no no income tax could be in the offing uh, you know we would be surprised if that doesn't happen uh, in this particular budget as we go into it so that is broadly it in terms of what we had to cover in this session at this point of time Thank you.